I'm back. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone. Today, tonight we have Terrence Shulman, who is going to be presenting, Are You a Hoarder? Understanding and Treating Hoarding Disorder. I would just like to give a little background on Mr. Shulman. Terrence Shulman is a native Detroiter. He completed his undergraduate degree in English literature at the University of Michigan in 1987 graduated from the Detroit College of Law in 91 and has been an attorney since 90, 1992. He has specialized in mental health law and criminal defense work. He returned to and graduated from the University of Michigan in 97 and has since then been a full-time certified social worker and addictions therapist. He worked as a counselor at a chemical dependency clinic from 97 to 2004 and was the clinic director from 98 to 2000. Since 2004, Mr. Shulman has been the founder director of the Shulman Center for Compulsive Theft, Spending and Hoarding in Metro, Metro Detroit. He counsels clients in person and by phone from across the US and Canada. He has authored four recovery books, Something for Nothing, Shoplift, Shoplifting Addiction and Recovery, Biting the Hand That Feeds, the employee theft epidemic, bought out and spent, recovery from compulsive shopping and spending in cluttered lives, empty souls, compulsive stealing, spending and hoarding. Mr. Shulman has organized and presented at many conferences across the US. He has also been featured in numerous media interviews, including the Oprah Winfrey show in 2004. Mr. Shulman has been in recovery himself since March, 1990 from addictive compulsive shoplifting and stealing. He is a founder of CASA, Kleptomaniacs and Shoplifters Anonymous, which has support groups in the Metro Detroit area and across the US. And now I would like to introduce Mr. Terrence Schulman. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Renee. Well, hello everybody. I think we've got about 10 people here and um, I don't know if there are people watching uh, live on Facebook. And again, this will be recorded. It is being recorded and it will be up on uh, the library YouTube channel uh, indefinitely. So if you want to watch it again, or if somebody you know or love might benefit from what you're about to see and hear, um, you can direct them to that or contact me. Um, my contact info will be at the end of this PowerPoint presentation, or you can just Google me. So I'm looking forward to presenting uh, on this topic tonight on this uh, hot muggy Thursday, late July night. And We've got everybody muted to begin with. Um, what I'm hoping to do is do the presentation for about a half an hour to 35 minutes and then take a pause for a couple questions, but you can always put something in the chat while I'm talking. Um, and the facilitators, um, particularly Kirsten and um, Renee, will um, maybe alert me that there's a question or a comment. We'll get to those. And then um, we're going to watch a video about halfway through for 20 minutes, a documentary about hoarding disorder uh, that I think you'll really enjoy. And then we will um, talk about the video a little bit, maybe unmute people after the video, and then I'll continue my presentation and try to leave a little time before 8.30 for, again, open questions and answers. Um, everything here is confidential, as confidential as it can be. So I'm not sharing any info with anybody. And even though um, this may be up online, um, so some of your questions might be recorded, at least if you're vocal. Um, we're trying to create a safe place here because this topic uh, for a lot of people can be uh, shameful, uh, whether you're here tonight and you identify as having had a problem with hoarding or you have family members or loved ones or friends or a partner. Um, but part of my goal in doing these presentations and I've been doing them semi-regularly, particularly through local libraries here in Michigan, uh, probably for about seven or eight years now. And I love doing them. I never get tired of this presentation or the topic or trying to educate people and to uh, destigmatize um, this problem, um, which takes many shapes and forms. You're looking at a photo uh, right here. Um, and some people's homes who um, maybe are attending tonight have had one or more rooms look uh, this cluttered. Um, or if you've watched any of the TV programs that have been on TV now, cable TV for over a decade, um, you will see kind of the, uh, the most severe cases of hoarding. Uh, 
because that's what TB does is they they take the most uh, intense and exaggerated cases about a lot of things, but um, your home doesn't have to look like what you're seeing right here for it to be a problem. And we're also trying to help people uh, get help early rather than much later. So um, as Renee had already mentioned, um, here's a little bit about myself. I'll just keep that on the screen for a moment. I'm not gonna read everything. So I often do these presentations, as I said, to the general public through libraries like we're doing tonight. And I've also done them for professional organizers and also uh, people who work in the mental health field who both need continuing education credits um, for taking various seminars um, and who often wanna learn about this either to help clients or um, just to learn about hoarding disorder more generally. So we want to kind of talk about three main terms tonight. The main one is hoarding disorder. Uh, we may use shorthand and call it hoarding, um, but it is officially recognized as of 2013, 18 years ago, um, as a real distinct disorder. Uh, hoarding has been around since the dawn of time, um, but it was also thought maybe to be a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder and or anxiety disorder but it really now is thought of both here in the US and worldwide as its very own uh, psychological disorder. Uh, cluttering, we've probably heard that term and often people who have actual hoarding disorder will think of themselves as clutterers. Uh, we can use that term, but there's a little difference between cluttering and hoarding and we'll get into that. And then there's also a term that you may or may not have encountered or would encounter in the future called chronic disorganization. And it's often somewhere in between cluttering and hoarding and professional organizers, which I think most people have uh, heard of. Um, that's a burgeoning industry. Um, I've worked with a professional organizer and my wife have. You don't have to have a major clutter problem or even be a hoarder to call them. But uh, generally their training um, would not necessarily help them to be too effective in working with a hoarding problem because they can have a lot of the great ideas, but you may end up getting nowhere if there's some emotional or psychological block that keeps people from really wanting to either move things around or discard them uh, so there's more space. And professional organizers might work with occasional clutters, but really they're looking, their bread and butter is the chronically disorganized, people who don't naturally have a way of organizing things and often need tune-ups. Um, and it's not just about clutter, it's about um, time management and also you know, finding a way of where to put certain things so they don't keep getting lost. How many times have we all, you know, forgotten where we put down our phone or our keys? So professional organizers can actually help with that. And sometimes we figure out our own best plan. Um, the prevalence of hoarding disorder, I'll just tell you right now, uh, my sense is I don't think we know. I think we need more research, but you will generally hear that, at least in the US, that anywhere between two and 5% of the population at some point in their lives will uh, meet the criteria for hoarding disorder. And again, that could be a mild, moderate, or severe form of it. It could be early onset in uh, your earlier part of your life, mid-age mid onset, or after, you know, uh, when you're well beyond 50 even. And some cases will be going on very long by the time they're discovered and some for shorter periods. Um, but I, I, use the I use the figure 5%. So we've got a bit over 300 million Americans. So 5% would be about 15 million Americans. Uh, probably any of you who've done any research or know yourselves or been in therapy or watched any of those programs on TV on hoarding probably have some general maybe understanding of why do people develop this problem? What's behind it? You know, And there are a lot of different theories. Again, I'm still learning. I've been working with this as a therapist for about 11 years now. Um, and I'm still learning and we're still learning. But there are some reasonable theories that might be helpful to the hoarder, him or herself, uh, and or their loved ones, and certainly to the therapist. Uh, what resources are out there or treatment strategies? We'll get into a little bit of that. Um, we've only got 90 minutes, so, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And, um, you know, I think we need more education uh, to the public and even to youth, um, catching them at an early age and, um, you know, uh, discussing our relationship with stuff. I'm not anti-stuff. I'm not a minimalist. 
if you're a minimalist, great. I aspire to be that one day, but you don't have to be a minimalist to improve uh, the clutter in your environment. But any way in which you can um, take this information and share it in some way with another person, that's kind of like outreach. And I, again, want to thank the Bay County Library for putting this on because I think um, people will be uh, informed and helped by this. So these are just our general goals and objectives. So what is hoarding? Um, now, if you're uh, interested, you could write a little something in your chat. It doesn't have to be a perfect definition, um, but it's interesting what a lot of people say. It, it sounds like an easy question, but it, it may not be. Um, so I've heard things like, well, it's when you have too much stuff and you're not using it. Uh, by that definition, probably we all are hoarders. <laughs> or um, you have difficulty discarding stuff. Okay, we're in the ballpark, but again, by that definition, probably everybody with few exceptions has a hoarding problem because most people do have trouble discarding stuff. Well, it's when it gets to the point that your place is unlivable. Well, according to whom, you know, uh, we can all have our own opinions, but it doesn't have to get quite that bad uh, before it can actually be hoarding. You know, it's kind of like the question, you know, at what point does somebody cross over the line into becoming an alcoholic. We don't always know. And sometimes that line's a little fuzzy. It doesn't happen like in one moment. It's a process and that's true with hoarding too. So you could be in the early stages of becoming a hoarder and not even know it. And then if it keeps going, it then you know gets into mild hoarding. But sometimes I use this um, politically incorrect way of um, teasing out a kind of a, a, a series of kind of definitions of this. Um, there's a comedian, Jeff Foxworthy, who does a routine, you might be a redneck if. <laughs> so, and we want to have a little sense of humor here, but in a respectful way, because um, I don't want to um, uh, reinforce any kind of shame around this, but sometimes we can talk about things with a little bit of lightness and make it sometimes a little easier to broach the subject. So if I asked the joke, not the joke or the question, like, you might be a hoarder if... And you can write some of these if you want in your chat, you know, but I'll start you off. So we got to be careful because what I'm about to say may not apply to everybody, but here are some things we typically see with hoarding. So you might be a hoarder if you have your curtains or your shades closed most of the time because you're somewhat afraid or paranoid even that somebody will look in and report you or talk about you. You may be a hoarder if you want to have company over, but people have been to your place and somehow they're not coming back. Or you may be a hoarder if people want to come over, even if they know that your house is a bit cluttered, but you are so embarrassed or ashamed that you start to isolate more. Or maybe your partner who doesn't have a hoarding problem is too embarrassed and doesn't want people over because they're the one who's embarrassed. You may be a hoarder if your place is disheveled enough that there's piles of things and there's kind of trails that you might have to walk through periodically. It could be just one room, which granted would be better than the whole house, but that can be a little warning sign. So if you've got one room, it could be the basement, the garage, where it's so you've got little trails you've got to walk through. They, sometimes refer to them as goat trails, kind of like the billy goats who go up the mountains zigzag, you know, to find their path. Um, that can be one. You may be a hoarder um, if you haven't gotten rid of hardly anything um, in quite a while. <laughs> um, you may be a hoarder if the mere thought of letting go of things, whether that's throwing things out, recycling them, gifting them, donating them, selling them, leaving them on the side of the road, if, if it brings up some fair amount of anxiety to you. You may be a hoarder if um, you're both blessed and cursed with uh, creativity. You can think of some reason to hold on to virtually every object in your home. There's some good idea about, you know, I could use it well, it might be valuable, I might need it in 19 years. This will be the perfect gift when my nephew graduates from college in 14 years. 
you start having this kind of cyclical thinking and rationalizing. We all do that a little bit, but it's a, a matter of degree and frequency and intensity. When you start getting into some cyclical thinking where you can figure out some reason or some excuse not to let go of anything. Um, you may be what is called a passive hoarder rather than uh, an active hoarder. So, and most people have a little both. Active hoarding is where you're either shopping too much, you're picking up things off the side of the road, you are going to flea markets, thrift stores, any store, and you're, you're, you're hyper accumulating more than you need. It could be with food, clothing, anything. Passive hoarding is when the things that come into our lives and homes in the normal course of living are not dealt with and discarded. So junk mail that ideally would be dealt with pretty soon after you receive it, whether you know you open it up at some point and you keep what you need to and you put in the recycling what you don't and you throw things out, packaging material that comes with things we buy or the Amazon boxes, food that has gone bad but doesn't get tossed, clothing you haven't worn in forever, books that you're probably never gonna read, you know, just the things that normally come in your life but we just can't, that's called passive hoarding. Maybe not, you're maybe not a super accumulator or super shopper, but, and usually people have a mix. So that can be, um, and there's a lot of other things. Um, uh, and again, if, if people in your life, particularly if you've got family members are continuing to express some degree of discomfort or embarrassment or anger even about the situation, but you are minimizing it or in complete denial, uh, people aren't always right about what they say, but if a lot of people are starting to say, hey, I think you got a drinking problem, or hey, you better slow down on your gambling, more often than not, they're right. <laughs> okay, so it gives you a little idea of what we're talking about. So what is cluttering? We have a couple of, oh, oh go ahead. we have go a couple ahead. of comments in the chat, sorry, go that ahead. I wanted to share. Please go um, ahead. There are unpleasant smells from bags of stuff, mildew, okay. et cetera. Yes. Um, you're depressed and have absolutely no energy to deal with the decisions needed to make for the stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, those were good. the two that we have so far. Yeah. And, and while it's not abnormal to be attached to our stuff, um, there can be a problem with being over attached to stuff. I think intellectually, most of us know uh, it's just stuff. It either can be replaced or sometimes if it can't, life goes on. Uh, the old saying, we can't take it with us when we die, but that doesn't stop people from somehow trying in their own way. Uh, many times they're leaving things behind for their relatives and saying, just think when I'm gone, all these treasures will be yours. And often the family members are just waiting for the person when they die to just throw it all out. You know, um, and, and if we over identify with our material possessions, there can be problems with that. Um, I'm not anti-material. It's again, normally have relationships, but it's the same way that if people, you know, it's okay to care about your body and want to look good. But if we get to a point where we're, you know, so obsessed with how we look that we're becoming either anorexic or having too many plastic surgeries or have body dysmorphia where you hate your body, even though to the average person, you look totally fine. Something can happen over time with the mind where we get out of whack. The same thing can happen. Money, it's fine to love money, but, you know, uh, being obsessed with money or making more money. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go on uh, around a relationship with stuff. So cluttering, um, you know, not everybody is a neat Nick. Um, if you happen to be a real neat Nick, and we'll show some visual slides a little bit later that will give you an example of, you know, total neat Nick versus little clutter versus mild hoarding versus moderate hoarding versus severe hoarding. Um, I have some clutter. I could show you my living room right now. There's a little bit of clutter on my table. I don't know if you can even see it, but, um, and I find as I'm getting older, I'm 56, uh, it's a little harder to, to, to get to things, but I try to stay on top of it. My wife, um, we've been married <clears throat> almost 20 years, and she grew up with a mom and a dad who both had pretty pronounced hoarding issues. And she was the youngest of three daughters, and it was really hard on her. Um, because she never wanted to have friends over. You know, somebody made a comment just about, you know, odors. Um, she always felt like her clothes or her body smelled because of the, the aroma in her home. And she was very self-conscious about that. Not a pleasant experience. And when her dad passed away about 20 years ago, it took a lot of work to clean out the house and put it up for sale and 
there was some structural damage. And then when her mom passed away after we had moved her into a, a studio apartment in a senior living, um, my wife and her sister threw out about a hundred hefty garbage bags full of God knows what into the dumpsters in the parking lot. And this was like a studio apartment, probably 200, 300 square feet tops. So one of the best things we can do for our loved ones is to kind of get a little more organized. It doesn't have to be perfect to be better. And clutter is something, you know, what do you think the difference is between hoarding and cluttering? You can put it in the thing, but I think, like I said before, a lot of hoarders think they're clutterers, but you know, clutter generally is a little less pervasive than uh, hoarding. It may be confined just to, you know, one or two areas. It tends to get dealt with sooner than later, or sometimes later than sooner, but gets dealt with. And um, if somebody touches or moves the clutter, well, I don't think anybody would like that. Um, it usually doesn't become a, a big argument. It's like, hey, what'd you do with my stuff? Oh, I put it over there. All right, well, next time ask me or whatever. But generally, people who develop hoarding disorder over time, they're extremely particular about their stuff. So if something is moved, generally they get a little more angry um, and reactive than the average person. And that can increase over time. Or God forbid, if something is tossed out by mistake, it's um, very difficult. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? So if you got clutter, that's okay. You don't have to be, you know, Martha Stewart. Um, but I think we can all kind of try to keep a little bit um, of a guard on our clutter because it it can pile up pretty quickly. And as we get busier and busier and older and older, it, it can overwhelm us. And a lot of times it starts with clutter and then it can move into chronic clutter <laughs> and chronic disorganization, which is clutter or just people not having any kind of ability to um, to have organizational methods. So they they don't, you know, their closet might be just things thrown in the closet rather than hung up, or they don't know, just junk drawers in every drawer. Or they don't know how to put their books. I mean, it's not a perfect way to do it, but that's often where professional organizers, organizers come in to teach people that, how to do it themselves, or to come in and do tune-ups, or tell you what to buy, the organizational closets or equipment to help you. Um, so clutter and hoarding are different. And I think I kind of just uh, talked a little bit about chronic disorganization. Um, and- um, We do have a couple of comments. Go ahead. Um, clutter can be remediated without too much effort. Right. And right. leaving things out, not putting things away. Yep, that's right, yeah. And um, there are some TV programs um, on uh, like there's a show actually on tonight at I think eight or nine o'clock on the Home and Garden TV network, HGTV, called um, Hot Mess House. And it's in season number two and it's a Canadian professional organizer. And she does a lot of with clutter. And most of those things, are, there are various degrees of clutter. I wouldn't call any of them hoarding because um, that's like a whole nother level. Um, and that's often where the therapy comes in and reading and support group work and family education. Um, but okay. All right. So um, whether you want to show through raising a hand or chat, I believe, I'm not sure how many people we have here tonight, but I think somewhere between maybe 10 and 15. And it's quite likely that you're here because you maybe know somebody who you suspect is a hoarder. And maybe you've had a conversation with them. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're not sure if they have a hoarding problem. I don't know. Um, maybe you know they do, but they don't think they do. It's a lot of that. And um, so thank you for being here. If you have a loved one or a friend who you suspect is a hoarder, maybe you'll learn something tonight. Or if they're not here, you can let them know about this presentation that's being recorded. And they can find it at the library website and on YouTube. Um, I imagine a few of you here um, are either quite aware that you have a problem. You may float in and out of some level of denial but or minimization, but you recognize you have a problem. And it's sometimes even hard to think of this as a, frankly, a psychological problem. You might think of it more as a quirk or a habit, but um, there's a lot of stigma even just around the term psychological disorder or mental illness. Um, we're trying to destigmatize that. Um, 
people who have we do have somebody that has raised their hand i think okay. they might want to ask a question okay go ahead but we're trying to unmute here and it's okay. it's not uh, uh you probably have to unmute everybody right uh maybe so. Let me try that. Yeah, try that. So if any of you here uh, know you have a problem or are here to, you think you have a problem, thank you for being here. We want to applaud you because there aren't many forums for people to get together to learn about this. So were you able to unmute? Yes. yes. Okay. I, I just actually put my hand up because I thought you were saying, can you put your hand up? Those okay, that okay. Have, yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can't <laughs> see everybody, but... And then, you know, there are people probably who come to these, I know they do, I don't know about tonight, where they're just curious enough about this topic because they're interested in how human beings, you know, about human beings and behavior. And here's what I'll say too. Um, even if you have never had a problem with hoarding, even if you've never known anybody with a hoarding problem, although you may not know that they have a problem because sometimes people are good at hiding it. Um, and even if you think you will never have a problem, Here's my message, and I mean it. You never know. There are people who are neat nicks most of their life and then develop hoarding disorder, and vice versa. They can go the other way. I know everybody says, oh, I wish I was a neat nick. Um, that has its own set of, of, of difficulties for the person and for the loved ones. It's no walk in the park um, being uh, having OCD in the form of keeping everything extremely neat. So. Um, but, but you never know because our relationship with stuff is complicated. And particularly as we get older, hopefully some wonderful things happen like retirement, wisdom, learning how to accept things and not sweat the small stuff, grandchildren, whatever, you know, a lot of good things. But, you know, the other part of it is as we age too, you know, there can be health issues for ourselves, for our loved ones, people die, you know, uh, loss of job. Um, all kinds of different things. Um, so losses and things like that, you know, tend to accumulate over the course of our lifespan. And that's why a lot of the people I work with, with various problems that they have, often are kind of midlife to late onset, meaning they weren't always having these problems. So you never know. Our relationship with stuff is complicated. And also just keeping a handle on, on, on organization uh, is easier said than done. So there are different things that people can hoard. They can hoard anything and everything. As I said earlier, there <clears throat> can be kind of active hoarding, active accumulation or passive and or passive hoarding, just not discarding or keeping on time. It's kind of like that. <clears throat> if you ever watched the I Love Lucy episode, uh, uh, you know, where the, she and Ethel were on the, the, the line where they were, you know, the, the, the conveyor belt is these cupcakes are going by and they've got to put some frosting on them. And then the conveyor belt kind of speeds up. And before you know it, they just can't deal with it. Like the cupcakes are going too fast. That can be like life where sometimes we feel it's moving so fast, even with all this technology that was assumedly supposed to help our lives be more calm, leisurely, and easy. It hasn't kind of worked out that way for most of us. Um, so, you know, things can get out of control pretty quickly. Even if like you're, you're, you're in the hospital or you're down in bed sick for a few days, stuff comes in through the mail and, and it's hard and people might put it off. And, and before you know it, it, it's too big of a mountain. You don't know what to do. And then it just keeps piling up. You know, people don't gain a hundred or more pounds overnight typically. And people don't become hoarders overnight and people don't get thousands or tens of thousands or a hundred thousand dollars in debt overnight. Typically they don't become alcoholics generally overnight. You know, so a lot of these things, take time. And we're trying to pay attention to the warning signs in our own lives and for those around us. And so clothing is a big one. I still have clothes, uh, but my wife and I, we try to donate once a month at least to Goodwill or Purple Heart or Salvation Army or something like that. Um, clothing is a big one, but, um, and I try to at least not have more clothing than I can fit in my drawers or closets. And, and if it's getting too too, too much for that, then I know like I got to donate some stuff. It sounds easy, but that's not everybody's, you know, parameters. Um, a big one is newspapers, papers, magazines, personal papers, books, and bills. And I tell you already, I know I got more than I need in terms of books. It's not to probably a, a hoarding level, 
um, where it's taking up a lot of space and um, my wife is complaining too much about it or, you know, but we all have a little attachment. And one of my goals over this weekend is to read some of my magazines and then recycle them and donate some books and things like that. I hope to get to it. So if you're the kind of person who has that idea to do that, but it never gets done, you might want to seek help or ask for help from somebody. Um, Cause a lot of times we have best intentions, but nothing's getting done. So that's where coaching therapy, a support system, a support group, um, packaging material, another big thing, boxes, bags, um, all different kinds of containers, food. I know when we were going through the uh, COVID, everybody was hoarding food at the beginning. You remember people were going berserk. Uh, we did a little of that, you know, stocked up on a few things, but, um, but a lot of people um, may hoard food like, uh, like they're, and I know some people are survivalists or they call them preppers, like they're waiting for the apocalypse or whatever. I'm not making fun of it, but a lot of people um, are kind of behaving that way but not really thinking that, but for some reason, there's an impulse to keep hoarding. And we need more food, everything has to be, and that can get out of whack. Even if it's non-perishable, it could take up a lot of space. It could cost a lot of money, time. Um, and then throwing out food that is bad. Um, and I'm no, I'm no pris. I mean, I'll keep a little cheese if there's mold on it and knock the mold off. But you know, some people will have things in the refrigerator and freezer that are truly inedible. Um, and but they don't think so. So they're really all the psychological disorders, whether depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, OCD, hoarding, addiction, really what's going on is, and we don't have universal agreement, but there's some distortion of thought. So if I'm feeling so down on myself that I want to kill myself, and while I, I do believe people have a right to do what they want in their lives, but there's usually a distortion of thought. I'm thinking so distortedly that I'm really feeling my life is over when usually it isn't, or I'm feeling I need that drink. My monkey mind is so craving that drink. I cannot not have that drink or I'm going to have no peace. So I take the drink. It's a distortion of thought. I don't really need the drink, but my mind is telling me I need the drink. There's a distortion of thought. An anorexic who's looking in the mirror, but seeing an obese person, that's really what he or she sees there's a distortion of thought. That's why anorexia is a psychological disorder. Likewise with hoarding, we may see a disaster area. We've had a couple tornadoes in our area recently, and sometimes a person's home can truly look like a tornado hit it. They typically don't see that. They see a lot of stuff and opportunities, and it's got its own organization. They're not seeing what the average person is seeing. And yes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And yes, in a sense, hoarding is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> but at some point, the psychological community has to get together and kind of say, something's a little bit off here, even if not everybody agrees. Um, animals. Uh, I see we've got Greg here today. I recognize one name. We've talked here, and he, um, I believe we talked a couple months ago, and um, we were talking about animal hoarding and um, if I recall, he uh, has a, um, um, a farm or two, a couple, works with an organization that rehabilitates animals or takes in different stray animals of all different varieties, if I recall. I, I forget if it's horses in particular, but I have worked only with a couple cases of animal hoarding. Um, and one I'm still kind of working with, although it's remedied, but it was a pretty sad story. But um, um, I often kind of uh, ask a little bit of a joke like, um, how many, let's just talk about cats, because cats and dogs are the kinds of animals that are most typically um, hoarded. Um, how many cats would you have to have to be considered a cat hoarder? It's kind of a trick question. All right. Aside from what any legal ordinance might uh, prohibit, or uh, an apartment building or a condo or even a neighborhood, you know, because they can have rules. I mean, you could break the rules. It doesn't necessarily make you a hoarder. But aside from the legalities, really, you, you can't just look at the number. You have to look at kind of like, is the person able to care for the animals in an appropriate way? Or are they getting overwhelmed? And typically what you see are people who are well-intended taking in stray animals, and then they breed, and then before you know it, they get overwhelmed, the person, and they love these animals. You know, people love their, their inanimate objects, 
you know, I'm a pet lover myself. Imagine how much they love the animals. And they're often thinking, well, it's not the best condition here, but at least they're off the street. But they don't really think to reach out to find the no-kill shelters, um, you know, or things like that. And when you try to, when, when those things are found out, they're often in the paper and, you know, it's embarrassing to the person, to the family. People are judgmental and they're, they're calling, they're calling the woman the crazy cat lady and the dirty dog dude. But those are sad stories. And they're often um, people who are having some psychological issues that distort their thinking into believing they can really take care of all these animals. Um, and they're very often isolated and don't have a lot of um, interpersonal relationships. So they rely on, they rely on um, animals uh, as their family, generally speaking. And not always, but sometimes many people who hoard have had difficult uh, interpersonal relationships. I think we all have. And not always, but sometimes they're looking to things to be their family or their friends because they've been hurt by people, abandoned by people. Um, there's a slightly higher prevalence of hoarding among persons who are adopted because not always, but often there are complicated issues around being adopted sometimes. Um, and then you can go on and on. Even digital hoarding, you know, how many of us have emails that we don't delete or we have trouble deleting pictures on our phone? I might need that. You could upload it, you know, um, and you have to keep buying more memory or your memory runs out. And uh, even with your DVR on your, uh, on your TV, you know, I know we have Netflix and streaming too, but, you know, for those who still have a DVR, it's like mine's booked up. The hundred shows are there. And even I have to kind of go through a little, when I want more room on it, I have to go through all of them and make a decision about what to, I can delete. And sometimes it's hard. My brother has even a harder problem doing it. So there can be such a thing called digital hoarding where you're having trouble deleting things. Um, that's the problem. And then I'm sure all of you have recognized the, the burgeoning industry of storage units. When I grew up in Detroit many years ago, <laughs> I'm sounding like, a, like an old person now here, but... I don't remember, maybe there are a few of those, but now they're like almost on every corner, at least at every mile marker in, you know, major town. And um, I've often uh, uh, heard the question, could you be a hoarder, but it isn't in your home, but just like if you have storage units, what do you guys think the answer is? In other words, could you be a hoarder just with storage unit hoarding? So, I don't know that I found a lot of research on that and the way the um, it's kind of um, defined um, in the psychological community. It tends to be confined to like the condition of your home. But the way I look at it is, yes, yes, you can. So I've known a number of people who, you know, with good intention, rented a storage unit during a time of transition and put things in it and then didn't have the time, energy or even the space to take it out. But they keep paying the fees and they're never going to take it out. And then sometimes they just accumulate more things and then rent another unit. And so I'm not against storage units per se, but you want to be careful. It's a slippery slope. And I do, uh, I have worked with a few people who most of their stuff was in the storage unit and they had to kind of deal with it finally because they could no longer afford to pay the rent on it. And it was a big decision what to do with it. And frankly, most of it got thrown out. And sometimes the storage place will just give you $100 and you sign over something saying, you deal with it because a lot of times and the time and the money and the hopes and the dreams or whatever, but a lot of times that stuff never comes out. So beware of storage units, generally speaking. Um, some consequences of hoarding, um, they're various. And this list could be almost similar to uh, a list of consequences of uh, drinking, drugging, gambling. In other words, you're going to have a series like isolation often happens with now, hoarding, I'm kind of framing it as a kissing cousin to addiction. It's not listed as one, but it can mimic it in that people can be in denial about it, like with addictions. They can start early in their life, later in their life. It gets worse over time if not addressed. It creates all kinds of negative consequences, yet it continues. If you are fortunate enough even to seek help and get help, there's a high relapse potential if you are not necessarily kind of in the mindset of ongoing recovery. So I don't profess to cure any of my clients, but I can help them understand, and sometimes their loved ones, maybe how they got here, 
that indeed this is a legitimate psychological disorder and that we try to treat, you know, both the actual behavior and the underlying issues that contribute to it. And we try to gradually make changes and get people kind of in a recovery foothold. And so it's going to take time. And then we figure out, you know, what might likely trigger relapses back in and we try to avoid that. So it's, I kind of think of it as an addiction. It could be treated a little bit. There's no magic pill for this, um, but they're still doing research. And, um, and we don't know for sure whether it's partly genetic and partly because of things that happen from the moment we're born in life, family of origin, other things, traumas, losses. It's probably a combination. We just don't know what percentage because they do think there might be a little bit of a hoarding gene like they think there's an alcohol gene, um, but we're not sure yet. Um, but there can be financial issues, legal issues, our mental health declines, relational issues, spiritual issues. It could affect your, uh, you know, uh, it could affect your um, reputation, um, all kinds of different things. So, uh, and that's also why kind of like an addiction, it, you know, and a lot of times there's a lot of shame and there's people are judgmental. And just like with an alcoholic, people may say, why can't you stop drinking? I quit drinking. Yeah, you got people who, you know, why can't you quit smoking? Why can't you just clean it up? How come you can't just lose weight? So we got a lot of that going on. And for some people, this is very complex and it needs to be dealt with, you know, in a, in a kind of a direct way, but in a educated and sensitive way. So one of the best things we can do is try to educate ourselves if we have this problem or if we have loved ones, educate ourselves and see if, if they want to kind of join in. And But often it is going to take some kind of uh, sensitive specialized therapy to help people connect the dots and to help people uh, get on track. There is a support group called Clutterers Anonymous that has been around for a while, a 12-step group, kind of like AA, but for cluttering slash hoarding. And you could go to cluttersanonymous.org and they have uh, different meetings. No meetings are meeting face-to-face uh, -face yet, I think, in most of the country with rare exceptions, but they do have phone group meetings and Zoom meetings. There's a Monday night meeting out of Ann Arbor. Anybody can attend it because they have people from around the country who attend the Monday 6 to 7 p.m. meeting. Uh, if you want that info, I can give it to you or go to cluttersanonymous.org. So here's the chunky clunky definition in what is called the DSM-5, Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Psychological Disorders, fifth edition that came out in 2013, so eight years ago. The DSM has been around for almost 100 years. About every 15 to 20 years, they update. You know, they had volume one, but we're up to volume five. So they basically have three elements, and usually hoarders have each of the three um, to varying degrees, but it's a, persist, a, a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with personal possessions even those of apparent useless or limited value due to strong urges to save items and difficulty and or indecision associated with discarding. Now, yes, who is to say what is useful or of value, again, but just as an alcoholic can make a very convincing argument that they are not an alcoholic, we have to have some kind of parameters to say this is what a problem looks like. <laughs> you know, and somebody can say, I'm not too thin, and you can say, well, you can feel that way, I understand, but we've kind of established, whether you agree or not, that you need a certain body fat, body mass index kind of level to be considered obese or to be considered anorexic, and you're on one side of the line or the other, um, plus your behaviors of, you know, not eating are dangerous to your health, you know, but again, people can be in denial. Uh, B, the symptoms of hoarding result in the acquisition of a large number of possessions that fill up and clutter the active living area of the home. Could also be the workplace, office, vehicle, yard, and prevent normal usage of the space. So typically, this does not happen in the whole home all at once. We're trying to prevent that from happening and hopefully have people get help before that happens. But a lot of things you see on TV, the entire home or most of the home is really unusable so, I mean, you can't cook in the kitchen, you can't sit at the dining room table, you can't sleep on the bed unless you have a ladder to climb on top. Don't, you know, you can't park the cars in the garage, you can't get really into the basement, even if there's a tornado to go down there because it's so packed. But it often starts with one room at a time. 
And if that doesn't get dealt with, and then, you know, you bring in more stuff, then it's got to go somewhere else. So it's kind of like the joke of, you know, the basement is packed and it's like the blob that ate New York. And one day something kind of comes up the stairs of the basement into the room on the main level, usually a kitchen, let's say. And there's a first object that appears because the basement's too crowded. So it's like coming up the stairs and, and then it violated the, it, viol it, it breached the boundary of that door. And, you know, so if people go back in time, they sometimes can say, I can kind of vaguely remember when it was starting to become a problem. My closet got full, the garage, I couldn't fit anything more in. And we just want to keep an eye on it. It's kind of like if you're gaining too much weight, you know, whether you step on the scale or not, if all of a sudden your clothes are fitting differently or you can't button your blouse or your pants or the belt doesn't have an extra notch to, you know, these are little warning signs. And unfortunately, a lot of times we don't heed them because we're busy. We will deal with it later. It's not such a big deal. We'll make adjustments. I'll just put another notch in my belt or I'll get a bigger shirt, you know, so we, we kind of tend to operate that way. Um, and then finally, the symptoms of hoarding cause clinically significant distress or impairment in a person's relationships or social life. Um, occupational can mean both your, your job or career, but also your movement of your body. So if you're getting kind of really bumping into things or tripping over things, and, um, or just, you know, just the general functioning or safety of your home. Um, and then we're looking, you know, if people are fortunate or brave enough to get treatment, we're trying to evaluate, do they have good, fair, or poor insight into their problem. So poor would be, look, I really don't have a problem. My husband's dragging me here. Um, you know, I'm really here to indulge him. That's kind of poor. Fair is, uh, you know, yeah, I got a little bit of clutter or whatever, but it's, you know, it's not that bad. I mean, you know, I, I have a little problem, you know, and then you see the picture and you're like, well, you know, it's the, and good would be, you know, some version of, you know, I really do have a problem. I've tried to get help on my own, but I, I haven't been able to do it. I really need help. I'm somewhat desperate. I'll, I'll do almost anything I can. You know, that's kind of ideally what we're looking for. But um, again, prevalence of hoarding. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, and uh, I'm just going to move on a little bit here. Okay, this thing, and then we're going to watch a little movie here in a minute. But degrees of hoarding, um, this is a little outdated, but sometimes it's still used with professional organizers or hoarding therapists, or maybe even, I don't know what they talk about on the TV programs, but they used to use like a one to five and what you see on TV with those cable programs, hoarders, hoarding buried alive, family secrets, the whole, you know, they're typically fives or high fours. Um, partly why I got into this is not only the programs, but um, I was, uh, working with people who shoplifted and did employee theft. And some of them were having a lot of clutter from the stolen stuff and not able to deal with it. And when I was working with over shopping, over spending, um, you know, before I got into hoarding 11 years ago, a, a certain segment of those people were having trouble with accumulation of things and not knowing what to do with it or how to let it go. But what really brought it home was my middle brother who will be 50 in October. Um, I'm 56, but um, he was always kind of a neat Nick growing up. Um, but, um, but he always had, I felt like a little bit of an overattachment to stuff in a way. And, uh, he's had some trauma and, uh, when he got to be about 30, so about 20 years ago, he and his girlfriend had a son, they broke up shortly after, and that was kind of disruptive. I mean, it turned out to be good in a way, cause they would not have worked out, but my brother got his son, uh, every weekend and I'd go over and visit. And over the course of the first few years of my nephew's life, I would notice that my brother's apartment was getting more and more filled up with boxes and toys. And I didn't really know what to make of it. And then, you know, about 12 years ago, my nephew was maybe about seven or eight. And I was watching him one night and I did go into my brother's uh, refrigerator to get something to drink. And it, it, it was kind of shocking how cluttered and jam packed the refrigerator was and the freezer. And, and I took it upon myself to start cleaning some things out. And there were you know, empty hot sauce bottles and things that were spoiled and moldy and, you know, mystery meat and a thousand McDonald's ketchup packets. And I cleaned it up. I put about half of the contents of the refrigerator and the freezer. I was pretty judicious. I left a fair amount, but I took out about half of the, it filled a great big black hefty garbage bag. When my brother came home, and I think you know where this is going, 
I did not get a thank you or a medal. Uh, he was livid. <laughs> and then I realized in that moment um, that I had violated his boundaries. But as I stood there and watched him take everything out of the bag and put it back in the refrigerator and the freezer, it dawned on me, I think my brother is a hoarder. So between the, the, the boxes and holding on to all these packaging materials and the, you know, and then that was the final thing. And so that's also what led me into this. And my brother's uh, situation probably in my judgment was maybe a, a two and a half, you know, on this scale, but, but still, you know, significant enough. And fortunately we caught it kind of early and he admitted it and kind of started to watch what he accumulated and got a little bit of help here and there, but there aren't many people who work with this. So now, um, these slides, are, these are stage photos, um, but they're kind of here to illustrate. Um, so this is a bedroom. Um, if your bedroom tends to look like number one, um, great. Um, maybe that works for, well for you and your loved ones, um, or perhaps you were in the military, uh, or maybe you have a little bit of OCD, okay? But uh, in number two, um, I know there's a big difference between one and two, we should have a slide 1.5, but Two, you know, I think most people, some people say, well, it's not that messy. Other people go, oh my God. So again, it's all perception, but we'll call two, you know, clutter and even three more clutter. And again, this is kind of part art and part science. <laughs> four, four, five, and six, it, it starts to look like hoarding. Um, generally, from my point of view, it may from, you know, where you almost can't use the bedroom or at least the bed for, for any purpose, so, you know, yeah, you could sleep on top of it, but that's going to be kind of hard, you know, you can be on top of stuff, but, and then obviously seven, eight, and nine are pretty severe hoarding, again, often things you would see on TV. So the interesting thing is, um, I do most of my counseling virtually, even well before the COVID, by phone and increasingly through video, and it's kind of, uh, kind of easy to work with people with hoarding disorder by video, because they can bring you into your home, uh, their home and you can see things or they can text me photos or email me photos. And so, you know, it's funny because let's say I'm working with a gentleman, a husband who's a hoarder and uh, the wife really wants him to get help. He's agreed. And this has happened actually. And then, you know, and then, um, you know, I, I often ask them to trust me enough to send me photos so I can really get a kind of a sense of what's going on because often the hoarder is minimizing the condition of the environment just like an anorexic or uh, overeater might minimize their conditions or an alcoholic. And the partner is not always, but sometimes over-exaggerating it. Um, although I'm more likely to trust the partner. Um, not that the, this, the, the hoarders are trying to be intentionally dishonest. They just have a different perception. So I might ask the gentleman, you, I say, your, your wife says that your bedroom is one problem area where it's really cluttered and she's it's driving her nuts. What do you think? And he goes, I don't think it's that bad. Well, I understand. Well, um, can you, you know, can you send me a picture of it? Um, and and he might. And you know, and and or I can actually email this to them. But typically, what happens is, let's say from my perspective, objectively, I look at their bedroom, and it looks like a four to me. So it looks like, let's say, you know, just I'm using one example. From his perspective, he'll often think it looks like a two. And she'll think it looks sometimes like a, a five or a six. And, you know, so it's perception. Then the, you know, and then I'll say, well, I, you know, I'm telling you it's a four, but the bigger issue is like, you know, what would be good enough where you both can, because often the partner is wanting it to look like a one and it's probably not going to get there, even if the hoarder wants it to. So we might have to lower our expectations. And I'll say, well, right now it's a four. Could we at least try to get it to a three? I'm not saying that's an end point, but let's at least get it to a three. How do we do that? You know, so I like to think that way. And then maybe you get it to a two. And then the, the partner might have to live with a two. So it ain't going to be perfect. But if the partner is going to nitpick and be critical and say, I'm going to be happy with nothing less than a one, we're going to have problems. So um, here's a kitchen again, and a kitchen is an area where I think most people would want it to be as clean as possible, clean and sanitary. But, you know, so again, it, you know, uh, maybe some clutter in the kitchen, two and three. By the time you get to four, five, and six, the kitchen is getting hard to use. 
And again, Rome isn't built or unbuilt in a day. It goes in stages. So you don't get to a nine overnight typically. So, but obviously that's a problem when people can't even use their kitchen, but uh, that happens, that can happen. And then a living room, again. Um, so I'm gonna take a pause here. Any, any questions or comments before we show a, a short film? Because I think the film will be helpful and uh, lead to some more questions, but any, any questions or comments? So this is only Hoarding 101. You know, maybe some of this you've known, maybe maybe a lot of this is like, you're, you're really trying to digest it. It's a lot of different information, but it is a growing problem. There are a lot of growing problems in our midst. There's an obesity epidemic that didn't used to be. There's a clutter epidemic, you know, uh, that's getting worse. There's a debt, over shopping a debt epidemic, prescription pill epidemic, technology addiction epidemic, workaholism epi you know. I'm not saying that to be like totally negative, but there's a lot going on in our society on a number of levels, technology and otherwise, where we're all at risk for whether developing an addiction or possibly, you know, some mental health issues. So, um, so I'm going to stop sharing this particular PowerPoint. We may come back to it at the very end. If you have any questions, read them for me, uh, facilitators. Um, if there are any, or if somebody wants to say anything, otherwise then we'll go to a, um, where is that here? No additional questions at this time. Okay. Okay. No, I like that. Okay. All right. I'm going to play you. Um, it's called uh, Stuffed. It's about 10 years old. It's a 20 minute documentary. Um, and I love it. I never get tired of watching it, and it's about hoarding, um, and I think you'll relate to some of it. A picture paints a thousand words, and a moving picture maybe paints uh, a million words. So get ready for this, and uh, hopefully the volume will be turned up, and here we go. And then we'll have time for questions and answers after. The white sales have started. Oh, I had to put those catalogs aside and not order any bedding. Oh, and it's too bad because there's some nice stuff on sale. Have you ever had a collection? Most of us have. But when is it too much? And why do we keep so much stuff in the first place? You see it in magazines all the time. There's one book on the coffee table and a little flower. You know, that's not me. There's this mythology, gay people are neat and tidy. No, <laughs> it's not the case. What we have is a huge pile of stuff here laundry that's clean but not put away because there's no place to put it where am i going to put it i'm going to fill up these racks some more but even this is getting overly full sometimes um i can barely get to the stove over here which is kind of a nightmare um i mean i cook at a 45 degree angle and the only way i can make space to work is to pull out a drawer and put a cutting board on it I have one chair that I can sit in, which is what I'm sitting in right now. Um, aside from the bed and the toilet, there's no place to sit down. There's no place to move. The bed had a lot of stuff on it. And eventually there was no room for me. She had, uh, you know, things hanging from doors and, and uh, um, you know, kind of a narrow passageway through the apartment uh, with just stuff piled up to the ceilings practically. So part of it is just this idea of like waste and, and I just think things... You don't want your life to be wasted. Yeah. It's like living on a ship. You just go. Now, other people seem to be bothered by, I don't. I mean, I just go sideways and I'm used to it. Okay. 
-hmm. Now, um, yeah, this is how it gets dicey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An estimated 2% of the population are compulsive hoarders. That's one pack rat out of every 50 people. Extreme indecisiveness, procrastination, and disorganization are all characteristics of the compulsive hoarder. It's also driven by fears, fear of making a mistake, fear of losing something you might need later, fear of throwing away a part of yourself. People hoard all kinds of things. Most common is probably magazines, newspapers, junk mail, paper. Pretty much anything you can see around you and think of could be hoarded. The notion for a lot of people who have a hoarding problem is that I need to keep this because it might be valuable, it might be an opportunity that I should not omit, um, it might be important. Probably the most famous case of compulsive hoarding is the Collier Brothers in New York. In 1947, police received an anonymous phone call about a dead body inside this four-story Harlem brownstone. It took police hours to find a way inside the building. It was the home of Langley and Homer Collier, two wealthy and reclusive brothers known as the Hermits of Harlem. The Colliers lived completely cut off from the outside world, without heat, electricity, or human contact. Altogether, the mansion contained 136 tons of junk, and it was rigged with booby traps to protect the hoard. Among the brothers' stuff were thousands of books and the chassis of their father's Model T Ford. For years, Langley had cared for his brother, who had grown blind and paralyzed. Langley saved thousands of newspapers for Homer to read in case he regained his sight. Workman found Homer's body right away. He had died of malnutrition. The hunt for Langley's body lasted weeks. Finally, they found him a few feet from where his brother had died. He had been crushed under a pile of stuff. I just feel that things are just more reliable than people. They're like, there's a certain comfort I have with my stuff. Well, there was this kind of almost like ghetto mentality about food. You know, we were taught about the Holocaust really young and, you know, there might not be enough, so you have to save it. And we weren't allowed to eat the canned food in our house because that was for an emergency, like a war. Yeah, and this was Connecticut in the 70s. I was sent away to camp every summer. And I came back one summer and all of my toys, all of my doll collection um, was gone. When I um, asked my grandmother, you know, why she did it, she said I had too many toys. Basically, I was just first year in high school and I had started acquiring LP, record LPs, and I really liked my LP collection. I really liked music. And then when it was time to move, it's like, oh, LPs are really heavy. You can't have all those. You know, pick out your 20 favorite and that's all you can have. You know, my family was uh, not a very comfortable place to live. It was kind of violent and uh, nobody really trusted each other. And so like our stuff was kind of that was, that was our area of comfort. And at one point, we moved everything into storage because we didn't know how long we were going to be here. And then storage burned down. I think that a lot of hoarders think they're collectors. But I think that real collectors want to have an order to their collection. You know, I have no idea. Um how many dolls I actually have. There's so many. I think I might have around a thousand, but I've lost count.
Uh, he's in his evening clothes. Mm -hmm. And he ha comes with a whole array of costumes, costumes, um, clothing. Mm -hmm. He's got real hair. Zayas, uh, Galen from the TV series, and this is the Indonesian um, Hanuman from the uh, myth of the Ramayana. And here's the three wise monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil. So um, they're important. For me, I always thought of it as collecting. I'm collecting this. I'm collecting collecting this but when a collection gets so big and there's so many collections it starts to look like hoarding it's just so much stuff oh look here's a uh what is it do i really need this I've, i think i've ridden on it twice it used to be really bad like i'd be walking down the street if there was something shiny i felt like a raccoon i would like see something and i'd pick it up you know next thing i know i was keeping it the chipmunk carefully pries open a rosehip berry. It will keep the seeds within, hoarding them like bits of treasure. I am probably best known as a comedian for my squirrel impression. Um, I did that on The Tonight Show. advantage to individuals who stored away food items um, and probably non-food items, so tool-making supplies uh, for times of need. Hoarding and saving clearly is a conserved uh, trait along uh, the entire animal kingdom. There's a, what you might consider a hard wiring for collecting behavior in our brains. I'm not a collector. I just am more of a pack rat. You probably don't even know about this, but because it's in our storage crate in L.A., but I have a 400 piece um, Victorian dollhouse kit, it, uh, which I haven't put together, but I was saving that in case I ever had like a breakdown or something in, the, in my little project. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't buy that now because I don't think I'm going to have that breakdown, oh, but I'm just saying. This is something that you bought as an adult? Yes. <laughs> The reason my house looks so normal is because Mike. And there was just no way that we could both fit into her place without making room. I feel very threatened by Mike's efforts to get rid of my stuff. You know, he's somehow reducing me. <laughs> that, that me and my stuff is, and I've, I had all these it's I, like it's like with sculpture i'm trying to i'm trying to kind of bring you out of the uh out of the, the no, you're block not. of wood you're just or, trying to get rid of the thing marble, that distresses you, know? you. Because and then you the other thing that we have is i always stuff. i always if i ever propose that we get rid of anything yeah, even I get magazines you know we'll, we'll be i'll i'll be sitting here and there'll just be a huge sack of magazines there and i'll say hey Bets, can i can i throw some of these out or can i no 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 don't when my boyfriend comes over He'll immediately start pointing at things and say, can we get rid of this? Do you really need to keep this? This Sunday paper is from three weeks ago. Do you really need it? And nobody's actually been up here. I just, I just can't let anybody see this. It's too, uh, and after the therapist came in and said, you know, you know, this isn't normal, don't you? I, you know, I just can't chance it. I just, I just can't chance it. On the one hand, I want to keep it all around me and, and make this cave for myself. And on the other hand, I really want it to be clean because, um, I mean, this is a reflection of what's in my head. The 
greatest mystery is what's causing all these disorders and, and uh, what is going on in the brains of, of people with these disorders. Hoarding has long been considered a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder, but researchers now believe that it may be a separate neurologically distinct condition. We had observed a very interesting phenomenon in a couple of our patients. Dr. Anderson and his colleagues studied a rare group of hoarders who started collecting after strokes, brain tumors, and blows to the head. The injuries had one thing in common. They all occurred in the area of the brain called the mesial prefrontal cortex. It's a part of the brain that we do not understand very well. It's a part of the brain that's very involved in emotional behavior, social behavior. Most hoarders don't have brain damage, but it turns out they show low activity in a very similar area of the brain. These areas right in here in white show the areas that had lower brain metabolism, lower brain activity in compulsive hoarders as compared to normal controls. This posterior part of the cingulate gyrus is involved in mediating visual spatial activity and memory and emotional processes. This area of the brain appears to regulate the primal urge to collect in humans, steering it into socially acceptable forms. In compulsive hoarders, this mechanism doesn't work properly, and the drive to collect runs unchecked while the clutter piles up. Sure you've heard whoever dies with the most toys wins so that's a big thing in the american culture is to consume and collect and get more and get more they never tell you where you're going to put it once you get it bought i realized it was a problem for me when health inspectors were coming and i just about died the health inspectors showed up and what they said was wow you have a lot of stuff <laughs> that's exactly <coughs> what they said and i went yeah and since a lot of it's hanging from the ceiling, they said, well, you put it up there. If there's an earthquake and all the stuff falls on your head, it's your own fault. That's when I sort of realized that I should seek help and start looking into what's involved with the behaviors I'm going through and, and try and do something, you know. I keep watching these programs on television where these professional organizers come in and help people and in a matter of, you know, days. The apartments are fantastic and they come in and paint for them and give them new furniture and, you know, $3,000 and the place is all fantastic. And, you know, I keep watching and I keep thinking, oh, you know, that could be me. Once it gets to a bad place, it's almost impossible to, you have to start it out like that and keep it like that. My new thing is food, because that way I, we can consume without collecting. Well, this is the list of things that I have in the cabinet. So A, I won't double buy any of this and know what is actually in there. So I tack this right up here next to this kitchen cabinet. And uh, when I need to know what's in there, I can just go to my list and check it out. I set a timer for 30 minutes. I'll say for 30 minutes, I'm going to go through this stack of magazines, pull out all the articles I want and throw away the rest. I took an interest in studying compulsive hoarding is because I rec could recognize the traits of myself. As of about seven or eight years ago, I haven't hoarded any newspapers anymore. I went through and like, realized that I had to start getting rid of them and that nothing terrible was going to happen if I didn't get a chance to read, you know, the, the Time magazine from three months ago. If I have to get it in and out of the bathroom, it just wheels really easily and I can just get into the bathroom. Of course, there's um, um, a vacuum cleaner in the way right now, but that's okay. I can move that. That's on wheels too. But um, this is really easy to move as opposed to before when I, um, before I rented the storage room, there were also chairs and other things I had to move before I could get in and out of my um, front door. I still have some control. I'm not a complete hoarder yet. Can somebody give me a push? Please. Oh, thank you. 
That's all I needed was one push. It's amazing how um, you can become very attached to things. And it's stupid. And um, uh, a lot of this stuff you can just get rid of. And um, it's, it's very freeing. But at the same time, when you're going through this stuff, um, it, it becomes very painful. I sometimes think, can't I just enjoy the things I have? Do I always need more? I try and tell myself, if there's no room to put it, don't bring it in. But I find it that I still do. One of the things that I worry about is when I die, if I die first, he's going to just throw away all my stuff. When I moved the things into storage and I was thinking about them, you know, I really don't want them back. Okay. One second. Okay, hang on. Hold on one second here. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Are we back here? Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see this here? Okay, let me see. Can everybody see me in the, the PowerPoint again? Okay, let's unmute everybody and let's see if uh, we can release the hounds here. Uh, we trust that you'll maybe one at a time. So um, any comments about the video? Um, hopefully um, we can unmute you here. Um, let's see, Renee and Kirsten, uh, if you're able to unmute everybody, if possible. I found it interesting, the one comment the lady made about uh, she felt her, her living a, was a reflection of what's going on in her mind, head. Yeah, that's powerful, isn't it, Mary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you think about it, that applies to anything. So whether you are obese or anorexic or a gambler or a shoplifter, you know, it's like something's going on up here. Yeah, it's a very powerful statement. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, I, I never get tired of watching that video. It's, uh, it's well done, I think. No, I've been waiting. I've been waiting a long time. I mean, I cleaned out my closet, but there were certain things I wouldn't get rid of. And so I started cleaning out yesterday again. And I'm using, I don't know, I can't remember her name, Dr. Schulman, but if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. Oh, that's uh, Marie Kondo. <laughs> yes. And I have gotten rid of a lot. And good. It feels really good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because there's a lot of things I kept the first time I cleaned that I thought, well, I'll surely wear this. I'll surely wear this. And I haven't worn any of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, I've worked with um, a variety of people and um, with varying degrees of success. Um, I typically start people off with a brief therapy program of about 10 sessions over a 12 week period. Um, and, and most people are, you know, are, if you're able to be sensitive and inquisitive and non-judgmental and really try to learn their story and help them piece together and, 
you know, normalize it in a way that they're not the only one with this problem. Um, you know, they, they start to be able to have little breakthroughs where they can start maybe letting go of a few things. And for some people, that's monumental because they've been totally paralyzed, so to speak, for, you know, years, if not decades. And just to get the engine going, just like within Alcoholics Anonymous, just, you know, if you've been drinking every day of your life and you can get one day sober, that's a start and that's to be celebrated. And, um, you know, um, people will ebb and flow. Um, and again, the goal is not necessarily to have your place look like Martha Stewart unless you want to or become a minimalist. But a good program. Still going? Yeah. You're a fan of the nerds, Karen? No. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Did anybody else want to make a comment about the video? And while we're kind of winding down, while we're kind of making comments or asking questions, um, you can either unmute yourself, I think. Um, obviously, some people have been talking. Comments or questions? I'm just going to kind of, in the interest of time, you know, I'm going to put some different... Uh, screens up here while people are making comments either about the video or, any, or anything from tonight or you know if you have a question for me too so we'll just kind of keep it open here till the end so how does someone actually fill the void to um if somebody is hoarding and they get rid of stuff is there a portion of their psyche or that sort of feels that they need to fill that in and rather than more stuff what can they fill it with that is that's a great question um and yeah that is a very good phrase people are often filling the void um you know we can do that with food with booze with stuff with work with codependency helping everybody to access mm -hmm. exercise can become addiction tv watching can you know yeah so, well, that's where recovery comes in, whether you're in whatever you want to call formal recovery, which might be involving therapy and support group attendance and, you know, things like that, but, or even general, I mean, the, the key is, well, to, yeah, because nature does tend to abhor a vacuum, but partly we're looking for balance of ultimately where we, you know, we're not feeling as much of a void, or even if we are, we can either just sit with that feeling and breathe through it and let it pass or sometimes people just need to lay down or take a nap believe it or not to fill that void if they're feeling empty and then they can get up and be refreshed but but ultimately you know uh recovery can fill a void where you're talking to other people and you're learning about yourself and it could be challenging but also very beneficial it could be reading it could be getting out in nature it could be um you know any number of healthier alternatives Unfortunately, what a lot of people do is they trade Peter for Paul and they maybe stop shopping, but they start gambling and then that becomes a problem. They stop drinking and they start using drugs excessively or they stop smoking and they start drinking, you know. So we tend to do a lot of that too. Um, and part of it is filling a void, but part of it is just like not knowing how to feel our feelings and how to kind of deal with the things that have happened in our lives that maybe have been painful that we don't know even how to deal with. But I think through reading, through family support, through therapy, through support groups, watching educational videos, you can kind of start to recognize, yeah, this, this is hurtful, this loss that I'm trying to overcome or fill the void with, but it's not really, I mean, it, it seems like it's filling the void, but it really isn't. It's causing more problems and you're not really um, healing the loss or healing the trauma or healing the betrayal or the hurt or whatever. And then, you know, so we're trying to find ways to deal and feel and not have to rush to fill the void quite as much because sometimes we just need to feel whatever. We might have to feel the sadness. We might have to feel the anger. We might have to feel the, the guilt, the confusion, the whatever, uh, and, and, and deal with that. Whether we talk about it, we feel it, we breathe, we pray, we journal. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, but it's easier said than done if you've been used to doing it a certain way for so long or only doing maladaptive ways of trying to numb your feelings or avoid your feelings or, you know, illus in an illusory way, fill the void. But we're, we are trying to fill the void. And for a lot of people in recovery, they find out that, you know, the, the support groups fill a void because I'm connecting and I'm dealing or, you know, going on a trip or getting back to a hobby or work, you know, or finding a better job or, getting into a relationship or getting out of a relationship. I mean, there, there really are a lot of ways. It's up to the individual to figure out 
you know, what works. And there's a little trial and error, but I don't know if that was a satisfactory answer, but uh, there's mm -hmm. times I've been, I've been in recovery for a long time from shoplifting and codependency, and I still feel, feel empty at times. And that's, that's a kind of a human experience. And, um, and I'm better. I'm not perfect. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm zoning out to too much TV and I have to kind of check it. I have to watch my workaholic tendencies and, you know, and I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Maybe that's why I went into addiction therapy because the more I'm living, uh, the more I find that I can become addicted to almost anything. I mean, I was never a shopaholic. I was the opposite. I was a shoplifter, but when Amazon came on, you know, I was starting to and I'm a bargain shopper, a uh, big surprise, right? You know, I used to like the five finger discount, you know, but I would be buying too many bargains and, you know, uh, it didn't get quite that bad, but, you know, it was enough where I had to kind of catch myself and, and, um, but I, I find I could start eating more as we get older and more sedentary. And um, my doggy is right here on the couch. He helps fill the void a lot. A lot of times I just like hug him and kiss him and, um, you know, take him for walks and just talk nice to him and, you know, particularly if I'm having a down day, but not always. And, and you know, sometimes that just passes. I feel better. So um, great question, though. Um, anybody else? we got just a few minutes left. Schumann, I have to go. I'm sorry. Who's that? Lisa. Hi, Lisa. I have to go. Okay. Is that the Thank Lisa? Thank you very much. Lisa, do we know each other or no? Because I there was another Lisa who was... Oh, I'm Nurse Lisa. Oh, you are a nurse. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you were here and thank you for being a hero. Oh, there you are. That is Lisa. Yeah. Okay. Finally, I put a name with a face. Okay. Yeah. You were talking earlier and I didn't, I didn't put it together. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Um, again, I'm putting this up on the screen. Um, we won't have a lot of time to talk about it, but just read that. But any other comments or questions? I know we've just got a couple minutes left, but. I have another one if, if somebody else is fine, but um, are there sort of some statistics as to, um, you know, get up, make your bed, uh, make sure you get eight hours sleep, make sure you're getting meals. Are there other things besides some of those very basic? Well, those are, you know, uh, the big three, you know, nutrition, exercise or movement and uh, sleep, nutrition, exercise, movement, sleep. But then, of course, it can be things like prayer and meditation, things that you can just sit down and do. You know, uh, everything helps. So a lot of times getting into recovery, and if you're, you know, if you're finding it hard even to stop the addictive behavior or the hoarding, even if you start just getting into therapy or joining a support group or reading about it or trying to break your pattern and get outdoors a little bit, something that's a little more healthy and life-affirming and it can kind of um, it can kind of dislodge the stagnation or the paralysis a little bit. So sometimes you got to come around it, you know, from the back way, and then you know start doing other health, healthier habits. But um, a lot of people who come to me, not always, but usually, most people get into therapy when there's a crisis, and with hoarding, those crises can be numerous. Uh, it could be a marriage on the brink of divorce. It could be. The kids are being affected. It could be there's a health and safety issue that's alarming and needs to be remedied. Uh, a few cases I've had where my clients have, you know, had to put their home up for sale and they had to deal with the hoard, you know, in order to get it cleaned up enough, and, you know, to show the home. Um, you know, sometimes people just get older. They can no longer even do anything about it, even if they wanted to. And now you're bringing in friends or family or other people to try to declutter and that can be really challenging for the person with the hoarding. So there's all kinds of crises, but uh, we're trying to handle things if, if at all possible before it gets to a full-blown crisis. Um, unfortunately for most people, it's gonna take a full-blown crisis to, to even think about dealing with it. That's kind of sad, but that's often the case. And I've seen that in my own life at times, but um, there's a lot of things we can do. To getting educated, and because sometimes we're beating up on ourselves or our family is not helping because they're mad at us and they're telling everybody and they're, they're contributing to the problem. They're throwing out our stuff without permission, which only aggravate, you know. So a lot of, you know, just like if you're trying to educate the family about the disease of alcoholism and maybe have them get into therapy or have them go to an Al-Anon meeting, which is for the loved one of the alcoholic. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done for the individual and the family. Um, 
I don't know if that answered your question, but there's definitely a lot of lot of components. Um, um, Thank you. Yeah, no, but you guys are a great group here. Um, we got time for one or two more comments and questions, and I think we're already at the uh, eight thirty hour. But uh, anything else here? Um, isn't it funny how, like, believe it or not, a lot of hoarders have perfectionism. Um, and people say, well, I thought perfectionists were the ones who's like, everything was totally neat and clean, but you can kind of see how they have the perfect idea for this and that and all these great goals. And they get really upset if, you know, they throw something out or somebody throws it out and they, they wanted it or needed it. I mean, nobody likes that feeling when you've let go of something. Oh, I could have used that, but probably your average person will get over it relatively quickly, but so they figure out how to avoid making a mistake is never get rid of anything. Um, I have had a few clients who both with hoarding and other who, who've had home fires or natural disasters where they lost everything. And um, that can be quite devastating to your average person, but sometimes again, it puts things in perspective. Um, as a matter of fact, some hoarders will joke and they half mean it. If only, if only I had a house fire or a tornado or some, you know, if there were an act of God or nature, that's the only way I think I could solve this problem because I can't make the decisions, it's too hard. And I don't want anybody else, any human being making the decisions about what to throw away. Um, and, 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 you know, the whole idea is, you know, maybe to gradually both talk about how this happened feel through the feelings, letting go of things can be difficult, but it's a little like exposure therapy with somebody with OCD. If I'm a germaphobe and I'm afraid to even touch a doorknob because it's going to have germs, I might have to, you know, talk about it a little bit and then gradually, maybe I put a latex glove on first and touch it, you know, gradual and I, okay, I can do that. And then maybe I just with my pinky nail, touch the doorknob real quick. And then you, you, you kind of build up and find. So what we're looking for is just to be able to be willing to let go of a few things. And not always does it just, you know, you know, get easy after that, but at least you have one breakthrough. And then as you're understanding and the family's understanding and you're, you're feeling a little better about yourself or you're more motivated because you, you, you have a goal. Like if, if it's getting your husband or your wife off your back, you know, that's one goal. If it's realizing I'm getting older and I, I won't have the energy or the mind even maybe to deal with this, so I better deal with it now. Or if you're coming to terms with the fact that unfortunately you have all these treasures that you want your kids and grandkids to cherish, but you're getting the sense that they don't really want it. Well, maybe there's a favorite charity or a library or someplace, you know, you start, you know, there's all these little things that come together or you have a friend who comes over and, you know, is maybe surprised, but still loves you and says, how can I help? So it, it, it can, this process can evolve in kind of mysterious and wonderful ways too. But, um, and then I'm not going to get into animal hoarding too much. Um, Greg, I don't we know. We do have you... one. Okay, go ahead. Final question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's from Greg. It says, with involuntary action being harmful, how does one go about introducing interventions to the hoarder? Well, I've never formally done an intervention and, you know, interventions, I assume, I know a bit about interventions with drug and alcohol use. Um, they're kind of similar regardless of, let's just call hoarding like an addiction. And, and certainly there can be intervention, but each one is a little unique. So um, it varies on the person and whether you're going to have a professional interventionist with you or you're going to try to do it as a family. But sometimes what happens, um, I've had a few cases where the hoarder will either not acknowledge a problem or they acknowledge a problem, yet they won't move any stuff out. And the family is kind of fed up. So they sometimes will do something like, you know, um, maybe we're partly to blame for this because we've kind of enabled it over time or we just threw up our hands and we didn't know what to do, but we can't do that any longer. And if you're not willing to get help, we don't do this with any pleasure or disrespect, but we want our home back or at least parts of our home back. So if you're not going to get help, you're leaving us with little choice, but to um, carefully and sensitively 
move and or remove some of your stuff. We're not gonna put it on the curb in the rain, but we will either put it in a storage unit or we will move it into the garage or we'll do something because you're not doing it. And you're still gonna get a lot of pushback generally, but that would be kind of a semi-involuntarily, like you're, you're putting people on notice that you're having to do that without any glee or pleasure, but you're not leaving them with a choice. And, and it's kind of like tough love in the same way that you say, you know, I, I know you've got a drug problem, but you know, we can't have you continue to live here because it's interfering with our mental health and you know, living here for, for free rent, we're in kind of an, I mean, it's a form of tough love. Um, so sometimes it, it has to happen. Um, and in rare cases, it, it unfortunately has to happen if the person is totally unwilling and, or maybe they're older and they're not even able to physically do it or they can't afford to hire a company to do it. And, and sometimes it does have to happen where if a person goes to the hospital, they go away something is done with the stuff. Um, you know, there are complicated issues where it's, it's kind of messy, but, but I do believe, you know, in, in taking back uh, our lives and in, in, in our homes as need be. And, um, it, it, you know, hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but it sometimes does have to. Again, I don't know if I answer your question, but um, you can try to do an intervention and get the family together, or maybe even a therapist or uh, friends or whatever and say, you know, here's the deal. We love you. We care about you. And this has gone on a long time and you don't seem to be acknowledging a problem or seeking any help. Things are getting worse. We're all getting older. We've, we've got a, something has to happen. You either have to go into treatment or get therapy. Um, and if you don't, um, we have to start taking our lives back and our home back. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. But, and, you know, sometimes that can work. Um, but, um, you know, um, I hope you guys have learned something today. Uh, let me just say in certain cases um, with harm reduction, a lot of times the best you can do, and this is true a lot of times with seniors where you may not be able to get them to acknowledge a problem or enter treatment or whatever, but you might get your foot in the door literally and figuratively, so to speak, by saying, look, here's the deal. Um, we have to at least remedy what we call health and safety issues that you may feel are non-existent, but we are very alarmed by, and there are certain uh, laws and health laws, and especially in your senior living, where we have to at least remedy this. And sometimes they'll be halfway reasonable because it might involve not removing too many things, but moving. So like if um, piles are too high or you know, there's areas where you could trip, you know, remedying those or making sure entrances and exits aren't blocked um, and things like that. Um, uh, but it really, it really can be a health hazard uh, as we grow older. Um, and also just if you're not able to vacuum or clean and, you know, there's dust that can accumulate. And a lot of people, for whatever reason, don't seem to want to open their windows. Um, they get used to the odor of, of some of the belongings. But I've been in a few situations that you know, it's, it's about hard and you, you have to, I don't do this full time. Um, it's not all the work I do. And lately with COVID, I've done pretty much all virtual therapy because I did, I did work on a couple of things where it was pretty hard. Uh, and I don't have, I don't have a, a, a soft nose. I mean, I can tolerate a lot, but I have to have them open the windows, put on a fan. And one woman had cats on top of it, which I'm allergic to. And I ended up getting some kind of rash or whatever. <laughs> Eventually, I didn't know what to call it, but so, um, but here's something, even for those of you who either have a, a mild problem or you consider yourselves more having a clutter problem than a hoarding problem, you know, they talked about using a timer. Oh, um, one exercise I sometimes do with clients, it doesn't always work, but, you know, I'll say, if your house were on fire and you had five minutes to make a choice about what you were going to try to save, you know, Hopefully it's anything with a heartbeat is number one, <laughs> pets and kids and loved ones. But, you know, but sometimes it helps people focus and, and there's no right answer. Sometimes people will surprise you, but you do hear a lot of things like I grab my laptop, I grab my phone, uh, some personal papers, a uh, piece of jewelry, a uh, priceless piece of art, you know, you know, different things like that. Um, um, and, you know, and that's sometimes just a way of saying, well, so see, you are able to, distinguish what's important because the problem with hoarding is like you know you could put 
an assortment of things on a table, including a diamond ring and an, ex and an expired coupon, and say to the person with advanced hoarding, pick out one thing that you're ready to let go of. And you think it would be pretty easy for them to just say the expired coupon, but it all becomes a blur and everything has a potential for something, a memory or, you know, and they, and they just get like, they can't do it uh, until they can start doing it. And then you celebrate that. I mean, I know it sounds a little silly, but it is kind of like somebody who's got one day sober. You, you know, for those who think it's no big deal, and the, the, the worst thing you want to do as a family member, but it happens too often, is, you know, your, your loved one is making a little bit of a dent, and they say, hey, guess what? I cleaned up the kitchen. And let's say they really did, not a lot, but a little, and you're like, I don't see anything. Oh, that's nothing. You didn't even make a dent. And it's normal to say that because you've probably been frustrated, and, but you really want to be encouraging. You know, you get, if you can be encouraging, I love you. I know this is a problem, but, you know, still be uh, direct and firm and stay on it. But it's a real art. Um, let's see. And then finally, um, books. Here's my contact info. Of course, you could get it from the library. Um, you guys have been great. I hope you've learned a thing or two. Remember, no matter who you are, what you're dealing with or who you know, uh, pass this stuff on, and our relationship with stuff is complex and complicated, obviously more for some than others, but keep an eye on things early on uh, in various areas of our life, but especially in our relationship with stuff. But I, I so thank you for being here with me. Uh, keep in touch if you're interested in anything else, books, therapy, support groups, feel, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Oh, my goodness, dark already. <laughs> there we go. Nice to meet you all. Keep in touch if need be. And uh, Kirsten and Renee, thank you so much for um, facilitating. Um, I'm going to talk to your boss and make sure you get 15 minutes of overtime. <laughs> thank you so much. We appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. And it will be up on your YouTube. Uh, so anybody wants to see it again, you could either call the library, go to their website, I assume, or some way you'll get people uh, to a YouTube uh, link, including I'll look for that as well. Yep, and the Facebook Live, you should be able to go back and watch as well too on our Facebook page. Great. Thank you, everybody. Blessings to you. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thank you. Bye. And go USA. <laughs>